If you're looking for an affordable stereo amplifier for under $300, stick around. Let's talk about the Cambridge AXA 25. At the beginning of the year, I had a unique opportunity where I actually rented one of my uh, vintage uh, pieces of audio gear uh, to star in a television show that's being taped. It's going to be used as a set piece. Um, they wanted a vintage look, and I had some pieces, and they uh, and they rented one. Uh, that's good news. The bad news is I needed something uh, to then uh, replace that in the meantime. And I was able to use a little bit of the money that I was given for the rental, and um, I thought I would try to find a piece of uh, affordable budget gear that's being offered right now to spend some time with it and listen to it and see if it'd be something that I would recommend to friends that are just starting out and building their first stereo systems or somebody that's just maybe looking to uh, you know build a, a second system um, that, and is on a budget. That led me to finding this Cambridge AXA25 amplifier and um, I thought it'd be fun to make a video and kind of go through uh, go through the features of the amplifier and tell you a little bit about what I like and what I don't like. So stick around, let's talk about the features with the amplifier first. So the most important thing to realize about the Cambridge AXA 25 is that the 25 at the end stands for 25 watts per channel. Now, a lot of my friends ask me, is 25 watts loud enough? And I will say uh, in my small listening room that 25, 25 watts was more than enough power uh, for my Emotiva uh, B1 Plus bookshelf speakers. Um, it was, it's more than loud enough. In fact, I've been asked to turn it down a couple times when it gets a little too loud. Um, but the volume knob, I, you know, I live anywhere between a quarter and a half, but I've never gotten it uh, above, you know, halfway because then it's just way too loud. So um, if you're thinking 25 watts doesn't sound like enough power, for me in my small listening room, it was. Um, the AXA25 also uh, comes with a variety of inputs. On the rear of the unit, you will find four RCA inputs. That gave me um, enough to hook up my uh, turntable, my cassette deck, my CD player, and my uh, streaming uh, my streaming DAC. So four RCA was plenty enough. If you need one more uh, input, there is an aux an auxiliary input here on the front of the unit that you can also plug into. Um, you know, with a 3.5, you know, millimeter um, uh, wire, you can actually plug into that um, and uh, uh, as an input as well. Um, now, on the rear of the unit, you will also see that there is a USB connection. Now, it's important to note that this is not an audio connection. So, when you plug something into that, you're not going to actually be able to listen, um, you know, to that piece of gear. It's really just for powering. So um, I have an Andover Songbird uh, Wi-Fi streamer that I use, and um, what I was able to do is simply run the USB um, power from the Andover into directly into the Cambridge. So when I power on the Cambridge, the Songbird comes on, um, and then I'm also running an RCA cable for the actual audio input from the DAC into the unit. Um, but it was kind of nice to free up one more space in my crowded power supply um, by unplugging the streaming deck from there and plugging it directly into uh, the Cambridge. Um, one other little thing I'd like to mention is on the back of the unit, um, right above the RCA inputs, it actually has like, um, if you'll see here, the inputs are numbered, uh, lettered and numbered A1, A2, A3, and A4. They actually print A1, A2, A3, A4 above the RCA inputs upside down. It makes it easy to, uh, when you're looking over the unit, to see where you're plugging your inputs in. I know it's probably not a big deal to people, but for someone like me that switches gear in, in and out a lot, it, uh, it was kind of just a fun little, um, a little bonus to have on the, on the back of the unit. Um, you'll also note that this unit has tone controls, so you can adjust the bass and the treble, as well as the balance, um, if that's something you're interested in. Um, I've actually not adjusted the, the tone controls on there and think it sounds fine. Um, I know there is a set of you know audio files, uh, a level of audio file that just says a unit should not have tone controls or balance. Um, you know, but I don't necessarily think this is an audio file level unit. And so for a beginner that may need to tune their room a little bit better with balance or bass and treble, this unit will give you the, uh, the ability to do that. Also on the back of the unit, there is a record out function. 
and what our RCA output. So what I enjoyed with that is being able to take a pair of RCA cables and run it from that RCA or from that record out uh, to let's say a cassette deck to my Nakamichi deck so that when I'm playing music, like say for my turntables, um, like if I want to make a DJ mix, I can play it through the Cambridge and then I can hit the record out um, RCA cable to my Nakamichi and actually record those DJ mixes to a cassette tape, you know, if I wanted to. And I don't know, I found that was kind of fun, um, something to include on a more modern unit. I was kind of surprised to see that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that um, are worth noting about this unit before you buy it. Okay, so there's three things that um, I want you to know before you run out and buy the AXA25. There's one of these things that I just generally don't like, but there's other two things that I think are worth pointing out, um, you know, especially for beginners that are looking to buy um, an affordable unit. The first is that um, this unit does not come with a remote control. Um, so, you know, you gotta get your steps in and, you know, walk up to the unit and adjust it by hand. The second thing is that there's no built-in phono stage or Bluetooth. So that means that if you want to hook up your turntable to this unit, you have to have either a built-in phono preamp on your turntable or you have to have a standalone preamp. I use the uh, Vincent uh, PH08 preamp um, and I have it hooked up here and then uh, my turntable is hooked up to the Vincent. Um, but if you're a beginner and you don't have a standalone uh, phono preamp, you want to make sure that either your turntable has a built-in uh, phono preamp or be prepared to spend you know around hundred dollars or more to buy that standalone phono preamp. Um, one other thing is that this does not have built-in streaming Bluetooth. So as I was showing you earlier with my Andover Songbird, that's what I use to stream music to this unit. Um, there are other units available that have built-in Bluetooth that you can stream directly to, but this unit does not have that. You would need to buy um, you know, uh, uh, a streamer. I think this Andover was $150 um, and there are others available out there. You'll need to buy that and hook it up to this to be able to stream music directly to it. Now the one thing that I just generally don't like about this unit is this little light right here. And I know this sounds silly, but there's actually a good thing is that the unit will power itself down It'll um, if you haven't used it for a while. So it'll just shut off, right? But this power light still stays on. It's like a standby mode, right? The problem is this light, the, it doesn't change much when, you, when it's powered on versus standby. Meaning like I just can't tell the difference between the shades of white that they used. It'd be cool if like the, stand, uh, the standby was red and then when it's on, it's the white light. Then that way you can definitely tell the difference because you know sometimes I'll start cooking or something and forget that I left it off for a minute and come on and hit a CD player, put the record on and I'm not getting any sound. And I'm like, wait, what happened? And I can't see this. And so I have to walk over and hit the button and then the sound comes back on. Very minor detail, I know, but it's something worth noting uh, before you buy this unit. All right, in a minute, let's talk about how it sounds. Okay, so how does the Cambridge AXA25 sound? First, I'd like to just point out that I'm not a professional reviewer of audio products by any means. I'm somebody that just buys a lot of audio gear and listens to a lot of audio gear, and I know what I like and what I don't like. It's kind of that simple. I was reading an article recently about uh, in Stereophile, and the editor-in-chief was talking about you know, um, using terms to describe how music sounds that a lot of people don't understand, and maybe it should just be more about feelings like how does the how does it make you feel and um, you know I have a modest budget system set up in a small room so I feel comfortable recommending products to friends that are just getting into audio gear you know maybe they want to upgrade from their Crosley record player and build out a traditional system you know um, I feel comfortable you know with my system being able to have products that I'm able to uh, recommend for those so um, you know you can take what I uh, take my sound review with a grain of salt you know regarding um you know my experience as a reviewer per se but um you know i bought this unit myself and was curious how it would sound so that i could recommend it to others here's what i uh here's what i think back to how does it make me feel it actually surprised me and made me feel pretty happy um i think what surprised me the most was uh that just how good this sounds for 225 dollars um is this an audiophile pro uh, product no 
Um, do I have other pieces of gear that sound better than this? Yes. But um, if you're somebody that has never had a stereo system before and you're looking to add something um, that has a sound that's not overly digital, you know, I think a lot of people buy products like they just go to Best Buy and they buy like the most affordable black plastic Sony, you know, or Onkyo or, you know, Denon thing that they can find. And it kind of has more of that digital sound. Like, you know, when you're turning the knob and it's like negative, whatever, you know, and it just sounds, it just sounds digital. For me, the Cambridge had a much more analog sound. Um, you know, it was nice and forward. Um, I could hear, you know, things that I expected to hear. It's not the most detailed, but at $225, you shouldn't be expecting to hear a lot of detail. But if you were to compare it with like a much more budget, you know, Sony amplifier or something along those lines, um, you know, I think that this does offer a lot more detail um, than something along that nature. So overall, like I said, it just kind of made me happy. Now, I will say this, when you first get this unit, it needs time to break in. When I first listened to it, I thought, I, I don't, I don't like this. You know, like it sounds strange, and I need to really mess with these tone controls and adjust the treble and the bass. Like, I was, I was, I was worried. But I just kept listening to it, and about two days later, it really seemed to open up. And I adjusted these right back to their center points, bass and treble. So basically, not, you know, not adding any bass or not taking or not adding any trouble and you know to me it really sounded like a great little unit um, it offers plenty of bass uh, I was listening to a live tortoise uh, show the other night and in one of their songs it's just this really heavy bass sound and uh, my wife was like can we turn this down so offers plenty of bass I'm using you know an affordable pair of Emotiva B1 plus uh, bookshelf speakers and which is sort of a great system for anyone just getting into audio and I think anyone that um, were to buy this along with those would be happy uh, with what they're gonna hear. Now, next, I'd like to talk about how Cambridge also has a model one up from this, an AXA 35, and I'll explain to you the difference between the AXA 25 and 35 next. Okay, if you go online and look for the Cambridge AXA 25, you may also notice that there is a model up that is offered from Cambridge called the AXA 35. So let's talk a little bit about what the difference is between those two models and uh, which may suit others more um, than the other unit. Uh, so in the same way, the AXA25 stands for 25 watts, the AXA35 stands for 35 watts. I uh, don't own an AXA35, so I can't speak to uh, how it sounds, but I can't imagine 10 watts of power would change the audio signature from the 25 that much. But if you're somebody um, that's just looking for a little bit more power, the AXA35, you know, may be something that you're interested in. Like I said, the 25 was more than enough volume in, um, for my little room, but you know, you may want just that, that 10 extra watts um, uh, for a room that might be a little bit bigger than the one that I'm listening in. Um, the other main difference is that the AXA25 is $225 ship, the AXA35 is $350. Now there's a reason for that price difference, which I wanna talk about next. Um, if you buy the AXA25, as I mentioned earlier, your, your, uh, your turntable is either gonna to have to have a built-in preamp, phono preamp, or you're gonna to have to buy a standalone phono preamp for $100 or more if you want quality, right? Well, if you move up to the AXA35 for $350, um, you're gonna get a built-in phono stage on the unit. So if you're somebody that doesn't wanna fool with figuring out if your turntable has a built-in phono preamp or if you're someone that has a turntable that doesn't have built-in phono preamp and you don't want to fool with getting a and connecting a standalone phono preamp, then you should really consider getting the AXA35. I don't think that that $100, uh, $125 price difference, that's about what it would cost you to get a reasonably good sounding phono preamp. Um, and so you're, you're really not spending that much more to jump up to the 35. Um, so that, that's definitely something I would recommend for folks. Um, you know, the, I think that's really the biggest difference between the 25 and the 35. Um, the 35 comes with a remote control, so you don't have to get up and uh, manually change the remote. You can change the input functions and remote control, you know, from the comfort of your couch or chair. And the 35 also has a bigger, dis well, it has a display screen. You'll notice here on the 
AXA25, you know, if you're changing the inputs, you don't know what it is unless you're looking at the knob. And the AXA35 has a display screen that will show you which input you've chosen. That may be, uh, you know, something that people really like just to kind of be able to understand a little bit more about what they're playing and where they are. It may also help solve some of this power issue because I bet that display screen probably goes off when it's in standby mode or something along those lines. Um, again, I know that power light's such a small little thing, but it still can be tricky. So if you want a display screen, definitely consider uh, the AXA35. Now, one last thing I'd like to mention is that Cambridge actually offers a matching CD player that goes with this for $350. So if you're someone like me that buys records, but still buys plenty of CDs and you need a CD player, I don't have personal experience with the CD player, um, but if you wanted to have one that would match your unit, especially if you're just starting from scratch and building you know, something and you really want it to all match, then uh, you could consider getting that um, Cambridge CD player for the extra $350 as well. So final thoughts about the AXA25. Again, I think this is perfect for someone that's just getting into wanting to build their first audio system at home. Um, so many people um, that I talk to that are just getting into listening to vinyl records and buying a turntable, they don't have a lot of experience with building uh, a system at home. And if they were to ask me to recommend something under $300, I would definitely recommend the 25. Now, if they were a true beginner and didn't really have any knowledge of phono preamps or they had an older turntable or something on those lines, I'd probably encourage them to get the AXA35. Go ahead and bump up that extra level for the extra $125 and get that built-in phono preamp because then they can just plug and play and they're ready to go and they're off to the races. If you're, uh, you know, an old school audiophile, um, you know, this is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of starter gear, right? It's not something that you're gonna wanna be, you know, interested in, you know, spending a ton of money on. But if, uh, or excuse me, um, you know, it, it's not something that you're gonna want to spend a little bit of money on and expect audiophile quality, right? But even if you're someone that really, you know, has a, an, an ear for good products and you just maybe want a budget system or something maybe for your office or a different bedroom, something on those lines, I would consider the, you know, the Cambridge AXA25 just as something simple to put in there. It's gonna sound a lot better than, you know, streaming through a, you know, uh, you know, an Amazon speaker or something like that, right? So, um, you know, still might be something that, you know, you would consider. Um, but yeah, I, here's the other thing too. Vintage audio gear has gotten so expensive and so many of my friends call me and they want a cool looking piece of vintage gear with the big lights and, you know, the silver face and all that. And you know what's, I mean, Pioneer SX450s are going for, you know, $300 or more. Marantz 2215s are like $500. I mean, the price on these low wattage vintage units are through the roof right now. And you know when you're buying a 40, 50 year old piece of audio gear that eventually you're gonna have to get it repaired, right? I've actually been trying to encourage some of my friends that just really want something vintage, um, you know, to consider something like a Cambridge AXA25. This to me doesn't stand out as ugly, you know? Um, it definitely doesn't have the big vintage blue light look or, or with the big radio dial or something along those lines. But if you're just thinking about a piece of modern gear, it's also not, in my opinion, it's not ugly and it's not obtrusive. And it's something that you could fit on a bookshelf, you know, or, um, you know, a table somewhere. And I don't think people are going to go like, ooh, what is that, you know? Um, and so I would almost recommend spending your money on this where you're going to get a lot, probably a longer shelf life than if you invest in a piece, over invest in a piece of vintage audio gear that's gotten really expensive and may just, you know, break. So again, I think this is a great unit for people that are just getting into audio gear. Um, I think people will be surprised with how it sounds after a couple days of breaking it in. And, um, you know, I would recommend this to any of my friends um, that call me and, and are just looking to get something uh, started at home. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you'd like to hit the like button, please do. It just helps spread it around uh, to people that might be interested in uh, gear, records, and uh, other things that my channel is about. Thank you for watching.